had to change locations, but we're going to keep on going. A bit of the rennet, tied in a cloth, was soaking in warm water. When the milk was heated enough, Ma squeezed every drop of water from the rennet in the cloth, and she poured the water into the milk. She stirred it well and left it in a warm place by the stove. In a little while, it thickened into a smooth, quivery mass. With a long knife, Ma cut this mass into little squares and let it stand while the curd separated from the whey. Then she poured it all into a cloth and let the thin, yellowish whey drain out. When no more, they dripped from the cloth. Ma emptied the curd into a big pan and salted it, turning and mixing it well. Laura and Mary were always there, helping all they could. They loved to eat bits of the curd when Ma was salting it. It squeaked in their teeth. Here's Laura helping Ma. Under the cherry tree outside the back door, Pa had put up the board to press the cheese on. He had put cut two groves the length of the board and laid the board on blocks, one end a little higher than the other. Under the lower end stood an empty pail. Ma put her wooden cheese hoop on the board, spread a clean, wet cloth all over the inside of it, and filled it with heaping full of the chunks of salted curd. She covered this with another clean, wet cloth, and laid on top of it a round board, cut small enough to go inside the cheese hoop. Then she lifted a heavy rock on top of the board. All day long the round board settled slowly under the weight of the rock, and the way pressed out and ran down the groves of the board into the pail. Next morning, Ma would take out the round, pale yellow cheese as large as the milk pan. Then she made more curd and filled the cheese hoop again. Every morning, she took the new cheese out of the press and trimmed it smooth. She sewed a cloth tightly around it and rubbed the cloth all over with fresh butter. Then she put the cheese on a shelf in the pantry. Every day, she wiped every cheese carefully with a wet cloth, then rubbed it all over with fresh butter once more and laid it down on its other side. After a great many days, the cheese was ripe, and there was a hard rind all over it. Then Ma wrapped each cheese in paper and laid it away on the high shelf. There was nothing more to do with it but eat it. Laura and Mary liked cheese making. They liked to eat the curd that squeaked in their teeth, and they liked to eat the edges Ma pared off the big round yellow cheeses to make them smooth before she sewed them up in cloth. Ma laughed at them for eating green cheese. The moon is made of green cheese, some people say, she told them. The new cheese did not look like the round moon when it came up behind the trees, but it was not green. It was yellow, like the moon. It's green, Ma said, because it isn't ripened yet. When it's cured and ripened, it won't be a green cheese. Is the moon really made of green cheese? Laura asked, and Ma laughed. I think people say that because it looks like a green cheese, she said, but appearances are deceiving. Then, while she wiped all the green cheeses and rubbed them with butter, she told them about the dead, cold moon that is like a little world on which nothing grows. The first day Ma made cheese, Laura tasted the whey. She tasted it without saying anything to Ma, and when Ma turned around and saw her face, Ma laughed. That night, while she was washing the supper dishes and Mary and Laura were wiping them, Ma told Pa that Laura had tasted the whey and didn't like it. "'You wouldn't starve to death on Ma's whey like old Grimes did on his wife's,' Pa said." Laura begged him to tell her about old Grimes. So, though Pa was tired, he took his fiddle out of its box and played and sang for Laura. Old Grimes is dead, that good old man, where ne'er shall see him more. He used to wear an old gray coat all buttoned down before. Old Grimes's wife made skim milk cheese, old Grimes he drank the way. There came a east wind from the west and blew old Grimes away. There you have it, said Pa. She was a mean, tight-fisted woman. If she hadn't skimmed all the milk, a little cream would have run off the way, and old Grimes might have staggered along. She skimmed off every bit of cream, and poor old Grimes got so thin the wind blew away. Plum starved to death. Then Pa looked at Ma and said, Nobody starved to death when you were around, Caroline. Well, no, Ma said. No, Charles, not if you were there to provide for us. Pa was pleased. It was all so pleasant, the doors and the windows wide open to the summer evening, the dishes making little cheerful sounds together as Ma washed them and Mary and Laura wiped, and Pa putting away the fiddle and smiling and whistling softly to himself. After a while, he said, I'm going over to Henry's tomorrow morning, Caroline, to bar his grubbing hoe. Those sprouts are getting high, waist, waist high around the stumps in the wheat field. A man just has to keep everlasting at it, or the woods t- will take back the place. Early next morning, he started to walk to Uncle Henry's. Before long, he came hurrying back, hitched the horses to the wagon, threw on his axe and two wash tubs and the wash boiler and the all pans and wooden buckets there were. 
I don't know if I'll need them all, Caroline, he said, but I'd hate to want them and not have them. Oh, what is it? What is it? Laura asked, jumping up and down with excitement. Pa found a bee tree, Ma said. Maybe he'll bring us some honey. It was noon before Pa came driving home. Laura had been watching for him, and she ran out to the wagon as soon as it stopped by the barnyard. But she could not see into it. Pa said, Caroline, if you'll come take this pail of honey, I'll go on hitch. Ma came out of the wagon disappointed. Came out to the wagon disappointed. She said, well, Charles, even a pail of honey is something. Then she looked into the wagon and threw up her hands. Pa laughed. All the pails and buckets were heaping full of dripping golden honeycomb. Both tubs were piled full, and so was the wash boiler. Pa and Ma went back and forth, carrying the two loaded tubs and the wash boiler and all the buckets and pails into the house. Ma heaped a plate high with the golden pieces and covered all the rest neatly with cloths. For dinner, they had as much of the delicious honey as they could eat, and Pa told them how he had found the bee tree. I didn't take my gun, he said, because I wasn't hunting, and now it's summer, there wasn't much danger of meat and trouble. Panthers and bears are so fat this time of year, they're lazy and good-natured. Well, I took a shortcut through the woods and nearly ran into a big bear. I came around a clump of underbrush, and there he was, not as far from me as across the room. He looked around at me, and I guess he saw I didn't have a gun. Anyway, he didn't pay any more attention to me. He was standing at the foot of a big tree, and bees were buzzing all around him. They couldn't sting through his thick fur, and he kept brushing them away from head, from his head with one paw. I stood there watching him, and he put the other paw into a hole in the tree and drew it out all dripping with honey. He licked the honey off his paw and reached in for more. But by that time, I had found me a club. I wanted that honey myself. So I made a great racket, banging the club against the tree and yelling. The bear was so fat and so full of honey that he just dropped on all fours and waddled off among the trees. I chased him some distance and got him f going fast, away from the bee tree, and then I came back for the wagon. Laura asked him how he got the honey away from the bees. That was easy, Pa said. I left the horses back in the woods where they wouldn't get stung, and then I chopped the tree down and split it open. Did the bees sting you? No, said Pa. Bees never sting me. The whole tree was hollow and filled from top to bottom with honey. The bees must have been storing honey there for years. Some of it was old and dark. But I guess I got enough good, clean honey to last us a long time. Laura was sorry for the poor bees. She said, they worked so hard and now they won't have any honey. But Pa said that there were lots of honey, there was lots of honey left for the bees and there was another large hollow tree nearby to which they could move. He said it was time they had a clean new home. They would take the old honey he had left in the old tree, make it into fresh new honey and store it in their new house. They would save every drop of the spilled honey and put it away, and they would have plenty of honey again long before winter came. And that is the end of summertime. Tune in next time for chapter 11, Harvest.